Happy Sunday. I want to express my appreciation to my chairperson and all the chairpersons actually for being very diligent. So what usually happens is that I will prepare the order of worship and I will send to all my chairpersons before Sunday, of course. And you know, they, they are very hardworking. They actually go through everything and they check the songs and the scripture and they can sort of figure out what I'm going to preach. So all my chairpersons would, would spend some time, you know, talking about the, the main theme following all the songs. Because the songs, the scripture, even the video anthem are all selected along the line of the main theme of the anthem. The danger, of course, is that they would have finished the preaching by the time I, I start, you know. So he has mentioned many of the main points that we are going to focus on this morning. But this morning, we're going to end chapter 7 and move into chapter 8. So I want to quickly go through what was taught last lesson. I thought last lesson was a very good lesson even for myself as I prepared for the sermon. We were at uh, chapter 7, verses 8 to 12, and it was about regret, right? The Apostle Paul wrote a very severe letter to the Corinthians, and it was brought there by Titus or Titus. That actually, there are two pronouncement, uh, pronunciation of that particular name. The correct one is Titus, actually. But in English, we always use the uh, King James or the Anglicized version. And Titus sounds in Hokkien like spider. So, <laughs> so I will, I'm going to use the word Titus. So, so the letter was brought by Titus to, to, the, to, to the church in Corinth. And it was a very tough letter and people got angry and, and, and upset and, and what have you. And so we dwell on the issue of grief and regret whether or not it is right to have grief and regret. And I mentioned how these days we are entering into an age without shame, without any sense that you should be guilty. And a lot of parents are told that you're not to make your child feel guilty because, you know, this is a very different world. And I trace some of the thinking to in the 1960s, right, when the hippie movement first started and some of you among us know what that is like. Most of you don't because you guys are also very young. In 1967, the Summer of Love happened in San Francisco and it was significant because that was a pivotal time in human history because for the first time, Everybody gathered together, more than 100,000 people gathered together to rebel in celebration of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So all these big rock and roll stars, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Chaplin, uh, Jim Morrison, who, the Beatles, you know, whole gang of people all came together. And so it was a declaration to the rest of the world that we don't want to feel guilty anymore about life. We want to do whatever we want to do in life. Who cares what our parents think? So it was a conscious decision to declare to the world that we have turned the corner. So it was significant. And so to understand this issue, we needed to trace the source of guilt. Where, where did this thing come from? Is it true to say that anything that causes regret and guilt or grief in our heart is, is a terrible thing? And we actually had to go back all the way to the Bible from the very beginning, the creation of Adam and Eve. And I highlighted to you that Genesis tells us that in the beginning there was no guilt. Adam and Eve were naked and they feel no shame. And then, of course, the fall happened and the consequences of the fall is that everything breaks. You know, this trend of thought will carry on to today's message as well because remember the Apostle Paul was continuing his message as he wrote the letter. And so because of that, the human conscience after the first fall of man is like a broken kind of a compass or a broken watch. It is like somewhere there, but it's really very inaccurate. So if you were to live your life based on your own conscience and the way you think, then you will make a lot of mistakes because your conscience is influenced by many things like self-interest, by culture, your tradition, the race you are in, your upbringing, so many, many things. And so as a result, we often regret what we should not regret. Remember, I tell you that Many often we ask the two most horrible words in the English language. Can you remember what are the two most horrible words in the English language? What if? You know, we ask the question, what if? What if I marry a different person? What if I was born in a better family? What if I'm more handsome? What if I'm more pretty? You ask the question, what if? And, and then you get into grief and you get into upset. You, you, you feel upset and you, you think that, you know, I regret because I was born in not so good a family or I regret I married the wrong person. And I wanted to emphasize one more time, every single one of you who are married, you are not to ask the question, what if? Because Matthew 19 says that what God has put together, let what? Men not separate. 
or let not men separate depends on how you want to put it so there is no what if in a marriage okay so don't go and ask yourself what if you marry Asing or Alien that you met last time that, that's not what the Bible tells us that we need to do and so the Apostle Paul says that this is called worldly grief and in contrast to worldly grief there's godly grief and godly grief has to do with the glory of God because at the end of the day all sin is a result of being fallen short of the glory of God, as the Bible tells us. So it's not just a simple question of do and don't. Do this, do that. Don't do this, and you do the wrong thing, you sin. That's a very superficial understanding of sin. The correct understanding is that you're in the wrong place. And that's why God sought out Adam after the fall. First thing God asked was, where are you? Not what have you done, but where are you? Because as senior pastor Dr. Stephen Tong has emphasized, the positioning of Adam and Eve has shifted once they have sinned. And so that's really what sin is all about. And so you ought to have godly grief when you are away from God because you have moved from the position that God has designed for you, a position of abundance, a position of joy, of peace, and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we are familiar with. And Paul says that godly grief must lead to repentance and repentance then to salvation. What a wonderful reminder to us all. So it is not true that you shouldn't make your kid feel guilty. It, the question is guilty about what? And godly grief is important. It has an important place in our life because when our conscience is made right, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will produce godly grief. But remember that at the end of the sermon, I reminded you that we are not to be stuck at the stage of godly grief or worldly grief or whatever grief there is because the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ is deliverance. It's always so that we are renewed again. And so that's the thing that you want to remember. And I point out to you that this is the favorite trap of the devil to always make you feel guilty, to make you feel that you are not good enough. Revelation 12 says that he is the accuser of the brethren and he accuses us day and night. So he's like the hardest working man in showbiz, right, in his business. He will accuse us day and night. And so we are to be very aware of it. And so we carry on to today's passage. There are two portions to it. The first portion ends chapter 7. The second portion open up chapter 8. There is a certain linkage to it as well, but I would like to separate into two portions so it's easier for you to understand. Let's come before the Lord with a word of prayer. We thank you, O God, for leading us slowly but surely through First Corinthians and now Second Corinthians. We do pray for a teachable spirit, whoever we may be. However successful we think we have been, however much a failure we think our life may be, help us right now to cast all our burdens upon you because you care for us. Help us to be teachable. Help us to be childlike. For Jesus Christ said, unless we turn and become like a little child, we will never enter the kingdom of God. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Now as we close... Chapter 7, the Apostle Paul reflected further on the work that Titus have done. Therefore, we are comforted. Remember, Titus brought a letter that was very severe to the church of Corinth and then had to report back to Paul what has happened. And Paul said, besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. He was sent to send this letter of rebuke and he was clearly uncomfortable. It was a tough thing for him to do because he was entering into a place with lots of problems and opposition. Remember two sermons ago, I told you that no ministry can be done without the help of the many. The ministry is not a ministry of the one, you know. Our Dr. Seven Tong, our senior pastor's ministry, spans the globe and he has hundreds of co-workers all over the place. The Apostle Paul had Titus, he had Timothy, he had Silas, Barnabas, a lot of different people who work together with him. And here Titus was sent to a place of difficulty. And so it calls to mind the need for courageous leadership and participation by the servants of God in very, very tough situation. Dr. Stephen Tong points out that one of the key problems with the church today is the lack of exemplary leadership. 
what he meant is that if you want to look for managers, you can find many managers. Many people say, I can do this for you if you have a template for me. Where is the manual? Where is this thing? If you tell me what to do, I can do it. Now, these type of people you can find very easily. You throw a stone, you hit someone who is like that. It is very difficult to find a person who will step out and go to a difficult place, who knows that this is going to be a tough thing to do, who will forge the direction forward. And the church needs people like that. We do not want to stick our neck out because we don't have the courage to do the right thing. We lack the moral courage often because we would rather be quite safe. I had a very personal encounter of this in my own ministry, you know, other than pastoring the church. I also run Habitat for Humanity Singapore. And Habitat for Humanity is an organization that builds houses for the poor around the world. So we would send people to all over the places in this region to build houses. Singaporeans would go. About four years ago, my father suddenly passed away in a massive heart attack. I still remember a couple of you came over at the wake. And so I was at the wake of my father and you know funeral wakes are often very stressful and my chairman of my board came so he came and he, he spoke to me and suddenly I received a phone call this staff of mine called me up and said you know take me can I can I tell you something that is quite terrible I say what he says somebody passed away I said passed away what does that mean you know Habitat for Humanity was started in 1976 so by now that's like 40 one years, am I right? 40, can do my math, 41 years. And in the 41 years, no one has died in any of the house bill that we have done. So it was, it was not something so that in, in, was in my mind. So I asked this staff, what do you mean? The guy passed out or passed away? There's a lot of difference, you know. The fellow said, pass away. I said, okay, pass away. There's a 17-year-old boy who went to Kota Kinabalu to participate in the house bill and he died in the middle of the house bill. And so there were a lot of shock in me because, my goodness, not only did the boy die, I am now the guy who is responsible for the first death in the entire history of Habitat for Humanity. And my father just died. And so I told the chairman, the, the guy just said, somebody just died, you know. And so it was very complicated and very scary and, and, and very nervous. And then the staff said, the parents will be returning tonight. They chartered a flight to bring the body back. And so the flight will arrive at about 11 p.m. So I suppose someone should go and meet the parents. And so I said, okay, pass me to my second command. So, you know, I had other staff. So I spoke to two of the, the second line com command uh, senior staff, and they already know the situation. So I told them that, look here, you know, I'm in my father's wake and all that, you know, the parents are coming back. Uh, the two of you go to the airport to fetch and meet the parents. I find out what happened. You know what they told me? I cannot. We, I dare not go. We, do, we don't know what happened. We, we don't want to go. We, I said, excuse me, I'm in my father's wake, you know. Surely you don't expect me to go. And the two fellows said, no, I can't. And so I wrote a note, minus 10 points in the annual <laughs> review. <laughs> so it, it is a terrible and frightening thing because... Who knows what will happen, right? And so I didn't dare to ask my chairman or the boss, say they don't dare to go, so you go. And so I went. So after the funeral wake on that particular evening, I went to the airport at about 11 to wait for the parents and to meet them and to find out what happened. And I was very nervous and I was very distressed because who knows what has happened. And when I... When the, when the plane landed and the, the entourage came out, the first person I met was the uncle of the boy. And the first thing the uncle said to me is, we are going to have a funeral wake and we are going to give you all the honorarium we receive, all the gift we receive. Immediately, I knew it was not our fault because he didn't punch me in the face or something. So what happened was that this boy was born with a heart problem and the parents knew that since he was young and he could drop dead any time. And of parents decided to let him live a normal life. He could have died chasing a soccer ball or whatever it is. And so when he was passing the break, he suffered a massive heart attack and he died. And so it was not our fault. But it made me realize that, man, my two sub-commanders are not trustworthy <laughs> because they don't want to stick their neck out. So this was not the case for Titus or I suppose Timothy 
or Silas or all the other wonderful co-workers that the Apostle Paul had. So Paul says, therefore, we are comforted and beside our own comfort, rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all for whatever boast I made to him about you. I was not put to shame, but just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting before Titus was proven true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you receive him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. So Titus was sent into a situation that was most frightening and most uncertain and he was not comfortable, but he was able to resolve the situation successfully and turn it totally around. And so what a wonderful, wonderful kind of testimony for us all. And I will urge you to consider the Lord calling you into leadership position and not into managerial position. You know, in this particular congregation, I want to encourage you to take the ball and run, so to speak. And so I often would not want to micromanage all my co-workers who are doing many different things all around me because I believe that the Holy Spirit will lead you into greater leadership. So think about courageous leadership, not just managerial leadership. What is it that God wants this congregation to go towards? Are there things that God has placed in your heart that you want to go out and serve the Lord with? Though, do not always ask, is there a template somewhere? Is there a precedent somewhere, a manual somewhere? Oftentimes there isn't. And the Lord wants us to forge new direction for His name's sake. And that ends chapter 7. And we will now go into chapter 8. And obviously, if you have been following the reading, you know that chapter 8 opens with an issue relating to giving. In order to understand the significance of it, you need to understand a little bit of the background why the Apostle Paul then shift direction into the issue of giving. The church of Jesus Christ first, of course, began in Jerusalem with our Lord ascended and the Jewish people gathered together to form the early church. Remember that the word church is ecclesia in Greek, which means the call out ones. So early church was really made up mainly of the Jews and we know that the gospel then preached Jesus Christ commanded in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem then in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth so from Jerusalem spread out to the rest of the world the apostle Paul was the leading apostle to the Gentiles. Gentiles are people like you and I. We are not Jews. The non-Jews are called the Gentiles. And with his effort, Gentile churches grew very rapidly during the lifetime of the Apostle Paul. So much so that tension began to surface between the Jewish and the Gentile believers. So it's like you spread the gospel somewhere else and these other people become much stronger than you and they grew a lot faster than you. And so the Apostle Paul took on the effort to get all the other Gentile churches to help the Jewish poor in Jerusalem. So that was the background of it all. And the Apostle Paul did that, of course, in obedience to God's command to help the poor, to love the poor. But at the same time, there was a strategic reason. He wanted more harmony. So, so long as the Gentiles are seen to be helping the Jews, then there will be less complaints from the Jewish people. And that's how we come into the beginning of chapter 8. So let's go straight into chapter 8. The Apostle Paul then talked about Titus having been refreshed, repowered, re-energized, and the role that he's going to give to Titus is, is to do collection. And so he started off by talking about the collection of other people. We want you to know, verse 1, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So remember, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. So he go to many, many places. So in this case, he mentioned the churches of Macedonia, including many churches in Philippi, in Thessalonica, Berea. Philippi is where the word the book of Philippians was written. Thessalonica will be first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. So for these two churches and the other churches around the region, it was not Titus that was sent. The book of Acts tells, tells, tells us that it's Timothy and Erastus were sent to Macedonia to do a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. So again, there were many different people sent to many different regions to do many different things. So this is a map of 
the Mediterranean Sea, and I, it's a bit far away for you. You may not be able to see it. But that, Cor Corinth is somewhere in the middle where Greece is. Jerusalem is right here. So the other places are Philippi, and then Thessalonica, Galatia is over here. So different people were sent to different places to collect money for the Jewish poor people back in Jerusalem. So it was like a very strong team effort. And so the Apostle Paul used that as an opening example as he was writing to the church in Corinth, right, telling them that you got to give to the poor in Jerusalem because the churches in Macedonia has already given. But it is the way the churches in Macedonia gave that forms the basis of this morning's sermon. Verse 2 says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I want you to take note of all the words that I've highlighted in yellow. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and even beyond their means of their own accord. In other words, by their own willingness. And so, you have a situation where the churches in Macedonia were clearly very poor churches, financially poor. And the Apostle Paul used the word extreme poverty. But at the same time, they gave beyond their means, willingly, not being forced, not being threatened, not being told that if you give this money, God will give you back 100 times in return, none of these things. Willingly. Verse 4, not only that, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So four verses describe a most unusual situation. Churches in Macedonia, extremely poor. So poor that they probably have problems surviving themselves. Second, Churches in Macedonia, extremely generous. Not only generous, the Apostle Paul didn't expect it even, that they would go out and ask for the favor of giving. Please let us give, please let us give. The favor of giving. Please don't, 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 don't take this away from us. We want to give. And then from there come the abundance of joy. And this whole situation becomes a most startling revelation in these four verses, that you have very, very poor people willing to give. So is that the case? When we think about giving and we think about receiving, and we think about the poor, the general knee-jerk reaction must be that if you are poor, you probably will be desperate, isn't it? And if you are desperate, you probably won't give more. And so in the line of work that I do in charitable circle, we are often told that go ask the rich for money because, you know, they are rich. So they have a lot of money they will give because they are very generous because they are rich. And don't ask the poor. It doesn't make sense to try to target the poor. And I cannot tell you how many consultants I've spoken to who tell me this, right? We segregate them, we target the rich because the poor will not give. Is that the case? I'm going to show you a video now. And this video is part of a social experiment. And you can find a lot of similar videos on the web, by the way. And I'm not a big fan of social experiment with hidden cameras, right? I mean, I don't like to watch those stupid comedy where they do something and then you, you, know, you become like an idiot because there's a hidden camera there and everybody laugh, laugh, laugh. Ha. On planes, they always show those kind of things. I don't know why. It, it's like... One of the problems is that it creates a sense of skepticism, isn't it? The next time you want to help someone, you keep wondering whether there's a hidden camera somewhere. So it's not a good thing. But this particular use of hidden camera for this social experiment, to me, is a good thing because it shows, it demonstrates something. It is a, a situation of the poor helping the poor, particularly homelessness kind of a situation. Watch the video and you will see what well, I guys, mean. guys, what is up? Today, I'm going to be hosting a social experiment. We're going to be finding out if a homeless person will go out of their way to help me out. If you guys enjoy the video, please share it, leave a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you very soon. 
Thanks for 5k. Hey, uh, how you doing, man? All right, mate, kind of nice. Is there any chance you could show me how to get to Green Park? People have given me the wrong directions for like the past like five minutes. Is there any way you could just yeah, walk me down? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much, man. What's your name? Matthew. I'm Jesse. Thank, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Better Monjay's, Starbucks, just going up to them like, look, I'm homeless. I want to feed myself and all the other homeless people. Yeah. And they were just giving me their sandwiches and food and I just got taken to the soup runners. Were you homeless at that point? Yeah, I've always been homeless. Yeah, this is it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. I've literally just got four quid I can give you, but thank you so much, Cheers, buddy. Man. Thank you, man. Take care. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good day. Hey, how are you doing again? Oh, hi, man. How are you doing? Yeah, hi. what's up? Matthew, how are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah, basically, I've been filming you, and we watched you go to McDonald's and hand out a bunch of burgers to people who looked homeless. Yeah, man. Well, what, people. what about yourself, man? That's amazing. I'm all right, man. Like, I get by and it was dinner time. I need to make sure everyone else is eating on the street. That's so kind of you, man. I've got um, some money. Take this. Thank you. It really was incredible. Um, guys, I've just had my wallet stolen and I don't have any money to get the shoe home. Is there any chance? I just gave him my last ten pounds. Mate, get home man. Sure. Get home bro. Cheers, man. I don't want to see you stuck man, but like, so you'll end up out here like me, mate. <laughs> it means a lot to me. Take it easy man. Just gave him the ten pounds man. Yeah man, he's gonna be stuck on the street, innit? We're still filming. We wanted to see if, if you would give money after you had just got money. Have you had any food today or anything? No, I've not, no. What, and that guy's not your mate? Yeah, that guy's in on it. He's gonna take the money. We're just so amazed that you just gave up all of your money just to yeah. help other people. Yeah, man, I can't believe that. Get yourself something to eat. Don't go and give that to other people, please. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Ah, so sorry. Because our original laptop is not working, so we are using the MacBook by that Chrissy has. And apparently PC don't work well with Mac. <laughs> Alright, anyway, what this video is supposed to show is a homeless person who was given some money by the guy who staged the, the presentation. And so after this homeless person was given like four quids, which is like four pounds, which is like seven bucks, the camera followed him to try to trace what he would do with his money, whether he would go and buy drugs or buy alcohol or whatever it is. And in the end, the camera caught him going to a McDonald's, spending the four quids or four pounds on burgers. Subsequently, he went to look out for three other homeless persons to give away the burgers to them. And then after he gave away all the burgers, he went back to the place and he sat down where he was begging and continued begging. And, and the cameraman or the young man who, who ran this social experiment went to see him and said, hey, you know, we didn't expect you to do this. So here's 10 pounds. Why don't you take the 10 pounds and you go buy yourself some food? And then they stage another thing. After he gave the 10 pounds, another young man walked by and said, excuse me, can you help me? Somebody stole my wallet. I got nowhere to go. I, I cannot go home. And the guy immediately said, here, you take the 10 pounds, you go. And even the second stage, second person was a stage event. And, and they were like completely flawed by this. And it was the most touching and amazing kind of a scene. And I encourage you to look out for more of this. In the internet, there are many people who do that. 
stage social experiment to see some of the thinking processes that we have are uh, flawed. And, and, but of course, then you, you know, in all these social experiments, you have a lot of comments by many different people. And some of them say, ah, this one is staged, cannot be real. Nobody is so kind, you know. And it is true that, of course, homelessness is a very complicated issue. A lot of homeless people are alcoholics, are drug addicts, schizophrenia, mental illness, or whatever it is. And I'm sure not all of them would behave this way. But it remains generally true that people who are poor will help people more. There are other social experiments you see that cannot possibly be, be fake. One of them that I wanted to show you, but I thought it was a little bit too cruel, was a boy that was staged to be homeless on the street at 8 degrees Fahrenheit weather. That's very, very cold, right? And the boy was ha having a broken T-shirt and what have you. And I don't know how they, they do this, but the boy was on the street for two hours on the street of New York, begging people to help him. Can you help me? And, um, and he was literally shivering. So you cannot stage that kind of thing, you know. He, I, I think it would be a health hazard for him. you get hypothermia or something like that. And for two hours, nobody helped him. Everybody just passed by with all their big coat and all that. And suddenly one guy came and said, little brother, can I help you? What's wrong with you? And then he said, oh, my parents abandoned me since I was seven and all that. It's all fake, by the way. And the guy said, then you have my coat. You have my coat. You take my coat and I, I, I give you money. You know, us homeless people need to help each other. The fella who, after two hours, the first person to help this child was a homeless man. And he is willing to help this child give him his jacket. And then, of course, then the camera crew appear and say, hey, you know, this is not real. You don't have to give him money. Here's another dollar. You take care of yourself. So there are many, many, many social experiments video on the web that you can go back and to look for yourself. Can all these things be real? I can tell you personally that it is true that the poor tends to want to help other poor more. Many years ago, when I first came back from my studies, from Texas, the first thing I did was quickly volunteer myself to do some volunteer work. And one of the work that was very unusual was called the SHARE program run by the Community Chairs of Singapore. So what they did was they wanted young people to come together to promote monthly giving. Now, these days, you are very used to all this gyro, CDAC, you know. All of you are donors of CDAC, right? Government force you to give one dollar kind of thing. You have no choice. But back in my, those, my days, those were a very fresh thing. The idea is to tell people that every month would you give one dollar to the poor. So that's called the SHARE program. So we were recruited as volunteers to go and promote the SHARE program. And we had a competition to see who can raise the most money. And within three weeks, I raised about $200,000 and I became champion. And I received... I was the youngest recipient of the Presidential Special Volunteer Award, and I was 28 at that time. And so it was big deal thing. So I had big picture in the newspaper, all that full page, you know, that wow, young man, very capable, blah, 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 blah. But I had one secret, you know, that my fellow competitors did not know. I realized very early in the campaign that, well, the, the campaign works this way. We will persuade companies to gather their employees together. And then one of us will go in and talk. So it's a bit like preaching, you know, and talk and tell them that, oh, you know, a lot of poor people out there, would you sign up and give $1 uh, every month? And of course, if you want to give more, that's fine. I figure out very early in the campaign that if I am assigned to a law firm, an accountancy firm, some uh, 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 big deal money generating banks or something like that, I will always not be able to get a lot of money. Because your lawyer will ask you 1,001 question and not give at the end. Accountant worse, you know, where is the money going to? How do I know that you're not getting a commission? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'll go home and think about it. And it never come back. And I thought that maybe the lawyer have mistresses, so he has many families to feed, so okay, lah, never mind, leave them alone, kind of thing. I figured out very early that the trick is to go to the factory workers, the cleaners, the low-income people. Which, which nobody like to go because, you know, those people work night shift and, and what have you. And I have another weapon. I bring Patricia along because at that time she was heavily pregnant with Shuyin. So we bring her along and then in the middle of the night we talk to all the aso, all the auntie, sometimes in Hokkien, in, 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 in Cantonese. And they give. And the problem becomes the other way around. I had to look at the thing and I look at the auntie giving $20 a month. I have to call her and say, auntie, 
and speak to her in Cantonese. Are you sure? I'm only asking for one buck, you know. You're giving me $20. Your income is so low. You want to... This is not one time, no. It's every month we'll deduct it from your pay. And they say, it's okay. We understand. We understand what is it like. And so I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when I read 2 Corinthians 8, I was not surprised because I know that this is what it is like. That if you approach the poor and ask them to give to the poor, your chances of being successful is much, much higher than you will approach someone who is rich. Now, again, I'm not saying that all you rich people don't give. I'm saying that that seems to be the way it is. Now, why is that the case? Why is this Macedonian churches behaving in a very odd way that we don't seem to quite understand for many of us? Again, we must go back to the root of the Bible to find the answer. Following last week's sermon, you think about the first design of God. I will tell you that, first of all, that we are all designed to share. You may not think that that's the case, but that's the way God has designed us to be. Genesis 2.18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Remember, this was before the fall of man. And so God said, I will make for him a helper fit for him. As mentioned in the last sermon on the sermon before, we were never designed to be alone. We were never designed to live life by ourselves and take care of ourselves. We were always designed to live in a community. In the earlier chapter, in a summary of creation, and God blessed them, men and women, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and so on and so forth. The original plan of God has always, always been community-based living, that we are to be part of a community and to fill the world with many, many people. And that's again before the fall of man. Therefore, we were designed as beings to share with one another. And that's the perfect plan of God. And when you share with one another, and when you are in the sharing mode, the giving mode, that's the original purpose, original design. And that's the purpose that God has for us. And it is not just in Genesis that this is said. We also find from Deuteronomy chapter 15, a verse that very few people know. Deuteronomy 15, 4 declare, But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. The Bible declare that there shall be no poor among you. How can that be? I mean, the world is full of poor people, isn't it? Because the next verse says, If only you will strictly, strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. The Bible is telling us that by original design of God, we were meant to share, to give, to enjoy the giving process because we were designed as a social being. We were never designed to be alone, taking care of ourselves. But as I preached last week, because we have sinned, once the fall of man happened, the first thing that happened is self-interest, right? Adam immediately said, not my fault, the girl's fault, the wife's fault, always blame the wife. The wife immediately said, not my fault, the serpent's fault, always blame your pet. So from one to another, it's always about me, I preserve myself, and that impact has lasted all throughout the generation. And so after the fall of man, this whole idea of being made to share, being made in a community, completely broken. And we become people who would not be able to tell the difference between what's mine and what's God's. What should be the way I should find joy? What is where true joy comes from? Because now, from now onwards, it's all about self-interest. I want you to know that the Bible is very clear about one thing, and that is wealth is a dangerous thing. Now, in Reformed Evangelical Understanding, we are not ascetic, as I mentioned to you very often, meaning we are not telling you to sell everything you have or go and be a monk or go and hide in a jungle somewhere else. But there is no doubt whatsoever that the Bible paints a dangerous picture when it comes to wealth. And the most famous of the verses must be from our Lord Jesus Christ. When the rich young man came to see Jesus, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus Christ said, have you kept the commandments? And he said, yeah, I did it all my youth. 
And Jesus said, then you go sell everything you have. Because that's the one last thing that he keep holding on to, right? And then Jesus said, and the young man left very sad because he cannot do that. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Only with difficulty. And as if that is not enough a warning, he added the next statement. Again, I tell you, just in case you don't get it, uh, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of pastors are very careful with these two verses. Because in case you offend the rich, better don't say too much. Huh? After that, they don't give offering, then your whole church have to close shop. So they try to interpret it differently, right? One of the more common ones I've heard is, oh, Jesus is not talking about the eye of the needle. You know, the eye of the needle is very, very small. Uh, in Jerusalem, there is this gate. La, it's called the eye of the needle. So in order to enter into the gate, the camel must lower itself and then sort of like slowly, slowly, slowly get through. And so a lot of pastors interpret this as saying that Jesus was not saying it's difficult. Jesus is saying you must be humble. So... So rich people will be quite happy. Okay, I'm quite humble, so you're right. Guess what? There is no such thing as the eye of a needle gate in Jerusalem. No? You go and Google it, you'll find. Because I tried to Google it, I was quite curious, quite interesting. Where is this eye of the needle gate? I keep trying to find. Thank um, our friend work for Google, so please go and thank your boss for Google. I, I try to find. You cannot be found. The fact is that it is something that somebody con conjured up some time ago to try to uh, make rich people feel happier. And from that time onwards, every pastor cling on to that very strongly. No! Jesus Christ is saying it's very difficult. Very, 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 very difficult. Now, if you, those of you who are poor say, hey, nah, I'm not rich, so it's not me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because the subsequent verses, the apostle then asked Jesus Christ, my goodness, that is how, how in the world can it happen? Anybody know what Jesus said? Jesus said, with men, it is impossible. With God, everything is possible. So if you are rich, don't worry. You know? <laughs> but you need to know that it is difficult. Now, just in case you think that, oh, okay, it's not about me. Huh? It's about this other guy, about this other guy, this other guy. Not true. When we talk about wealth, I tell you, every single one of you sitting down here is a wealthy person. As compared to the sum average of the people out there. So please don't go and point at someone and say that hey, it's about him, I'm very hard for him, okay? To enter the kingdom of God. It's not true. For Singaporeans especially, I say every single, single Singaporean is a rich person compared to the rest of the world. So it's very difficult for all of you to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because wealth has a tendency to draw us away from the original design of God, right? Much of wealth is designed to make you feel good instead of make other people feel good. So I enjoy myself, I feel good. Not that there's anything wrong with loving yourself and enjoying yourself because as I mentioned to you before, the Westminster say we glorify God and what? Enjoy Him forever. So please go ahead and enjoy that red wine because God has made, made good things for us all. But of course, at this extreme, you are drawn completely towards selfishness. So sometimes things get very scary. So this is a picture of San Paulo in Brazil, a kind of a luxurious apartment built right beside the slum. I don't know whether you can see this or not, but there's this little blue color circular thing, which is like a built-in jacuzzi for everyone, every floor kind of a thing. And I don't understand how you sell a property like that, right? You sit in a jacuzzi, you look over, <laughs> over the other side of extreme poverty. I mean, what? You can be quite happy in a jacuzzi. It doesn't make sense to me. But humanity has reached a stage that is completely nonsensical. Why? Because again, after the fall of man, what God has meant for good to us are all messed up. Wine is a beautiful thing. I'm not a great wine drinker, but I know it's, it's a beautiful thing. But it can also bring about alcoholism, isn't it? And, and sexuality is a beautiful thing within a monogamous, committed relationship. Most beautiful thing. But it brings about decadence, adultery, pornography, all sorts of things. So it's the same thing. Wealth, if used properly, beautiful, beautiful thing. And 
and in the theology of work, God wants us to create. God wants us to, to multiply. Multiply and fill the earth. God wants us to be industrious, entrepreneur, to fulfill the potential that is given to us. So you will be wealthy naturally. And that's a really, really wonderful thing. But it can also turn around and have a situation where you become blinded to the needs of the people. The poor, however, has less of that distraction because they are not blinded so much because there's nothing for them to, to be blinded with. And so therefore, they find it often easier to empathize, to understand. The homeless, they know what being homeless means, and so they are generous and they give. So it's the case with the church in Macedonia. What are some of the biblical principles about giving? First of all, looking at the case that the Macedonian church has shown us, we know that giving is a privilege and a source of great joy. As your second responsive reading in Hadi was mentioning earlier, said the Apostle Paul recall as he was talking about giving to the poor, in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, this is a quotation of Jesus Christ and not in the gospel. So you go and try Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you cannot find this verse. Paul remembered Jesus said this and so it's recorded in the Bible. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the Macedonian churches understand that. So in verse 4, the Macedonian churches begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saint. I think that anyone who gives generously and willingly understand that, that it is a privilege to be able to give, to be in a position to be able to help. I don't know about you, I have understood this all my life. I, and I don't know whether it is a gift. I was once asked whether compassion is a gift. I have been thinking about this for a very long time. I'm not sure what the answer is. I know that some people seem naturally compassionate. Some children are naturally compassionate. I always tell you that if your kids do not want to share, that's quite normal, right? If you share, don't, don't share. Oh, this is a game I play with all your children. You want to share? They all know. And they all find some kind of creative method to say no, right? Run away from you or quickly eat as much as they can so that they don't have to share with you. And parents panic. And you must share with Pastor Young. You must share with Pastor Young. I say, it's okay. That just shows that they are sinners. It's all right. <laughs> if your kids share naturally, something is wrong or a bit abnormal. Something is abnormal. Either the, the, the fellow has some, some scheme somewhere or the fellow is a great saint, you know, or God has given the child a very special gift. Hopefully, it's the second one. Lah. But chances is the first one. <laughs> In Chinese proverb, there is a, a word called Kong Rong Lang Li. Kong Rong is a person. So what happened is that it's, it's, a, it's a proverb that we teach children when they are young, that you need to be like Kong Rong. So when Kong Rong was three years old, the father came back with a bag of pear and tell Kong Rong, you pick any pear you want. Kong Rong went for the smallest pear. And so the father asked why. The Kong Rong said, I got brothers above me, you know, so I must reserve the big pear for them. And so it became a very wonderful story. But what happened was that when Kong Rong grew up, he was a terrible person. He betrayed his wife, he betrayed his family in order to get high position. So now we are rethinking about the historical event. The idea now is that this Kong Rong is a very devious child. She knows that if she took the biggest pair, the brother will beat him up. So he take the small one first and then he score points. You know, at three years old, he can do that. That's why when he grew up, he became so devious. So if your child don't share, please, it's quite normal. And if your child share and really genuinely share, please come and talk to me. I want to see whether the child can be, can be nurtured further. But it is a privilege indeed because you are returning back to the original design and intent of God. And God wants you to share. And those who understand this know that it is a source of great joy. The work that I do, I will tell you there are some selfish reasons behind it as well. Because it brings me great joy. So much that I cannot quite express it. That when you find that your existence impacted the life of someone else positively, is greater than anything that I can imagine. I mean, if you ask my wife, what are some of my so-called indulgences in life? She will tell you maybe art, maybe keeping fish or plants and stuff like that. And beyond that, there's nothing much that impressed me, you know. I don't know whether you know this or not, but I'm never impressed by cars. I cannot tell the model. To me, the box with four wheels and move was always a big deal. So, wow, this one is what, what, what? I, I don't get it. I don't understand this. 
because I derive a lot of joy when I realize that my existence has helped this person in Singapore, in Cambodia, in Batam, in wherever it is. And there are so many times in the field that I feel, my goodness, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I am doing exactly what the Lord has asked me to do in my life. Oh, as the churches in Macedonia has expressed, I understand the abundance of joy. So giving is always a privilege. If you are able to give, it's a special, special privilege because the some average person in the world, nowhere near it. But even the poorest person can give. The second principle that's important for you to know is giving is relative. This is very clear in the Bible. And the clearest example is a life example, not a a parable. Mark 12, and also in the Gospel of Luke, and Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people coming, putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sum, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make it a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, so Jesus saw something happen, not stage, huh? <laughs> something that was real. He called the disciples and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty and has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So the story of what is known as the widow's might has become a classic story in the Bible. And thank God Almighty that this particular incident was recorded in two of the Gospels because it always, always reminds us that it's not about the absolute value, but the world only look at the absolute value, including my charity. If you give a certain amount, we make you a golden giver or something like that. You know, all charities have that kind of thing. It's like a VIP card kind of thing, right? So we, 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 we celebrate you because you have given so much. If you give even more, you go into the second tier, the third tier, the top tier, things like that. And we celebrate people doing that. Now, there are a lot of givers out there that I appreciate greatly who don't care about such things, and this is wonderful. But they are, from in terms of psychology or how things work, most charity have tear giving. But Jesus Christ said, no, that's not how it works. And he, he is right, of course. Say you are a billionaire. How much is one billion? How many million? Who knows? Oh, good. At least you are not always thinking about money. How many million? 1,000 million makes a billion. Paul is trying to calculate. <laughs> 1,000 million makes a billion. So say you give me $10 million to help some do a large project. How many percent is that? Everyone wake up. 10 million out of 1,000 million. How many percent? 1%. 1%. From the angle of the charity, it's, wow, it's like 10 million. Are you crazy? It's just a lot of money, you know. But from the eyes of God, this 1%, no big deal. So it is not about the absolute value. It's always about the relative value. And so in biblical teaching, relative value in giving to in the church is often defined by two things. First is the idea of the tithe. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So many churches and many church leaders focuses on the tithe as a requirement for everybody. So relative to your income, one-tenth, 10% of your income should be given to the church based on Malachi chapter 3. And so in Singapore, it's very complicated, right? Because we have CPF and we've got all this kind of thing. So people ask the question, hey, should it be net income or gross income? The standard answer for most pastors is it depends on whether you want God to bless you on the gross or on the net. You know? <laughs> so you, you go and decide on your own. And so a lot of churches put a lot of emphasis on this, especially the mega churches in Singapore. They will set up gyro stations so that you will gyro your tie in. Why? Because they incur great expenses. Without your tie, they will die. Okay? So they, 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 they preach about this, and this is a really serious golden rule. In the Reformed Evangelical Church, we also hold on to the tie concept. But I must tell you, even though I'm recorded, uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of the tithe because it's an Old Testament teaching and teachers like John MacArthur Jr. pointed out that this came about when there was no taxation. It was a theocracy. 
So therefore, to then use this as a sort of golden rule is a bit risky. The better thinking process comes in the New Testament. We will approach this first later, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. The idea that the giving should be from the heart. Paul wrote, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So you say that everybody don't care how you're going to give me one ten. That's called under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So I believe that the higher calling is not the amount or a kind of a relative percentage. The higher calling is a cheerful heart. So with a cheerful heart, with a willing situation, whether it's a tie or not a tie or beyond the tie or below the tie, I think that's what the Bible is calling us to do. So remember, it is a privilege, a great source of joy. It is relative. On the more hard side, Giving is definitely a command in the Bible. And the Bible commands us to go back to how God has designed us to be. I have shared with you Deuteronomy chapter 15, the second part of the verses in verse 7 says, If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, your hand, against your poor brother, but you shall... Open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever it may be. And subsequent verses say, Lest your brother call out to the Lord against you, and the Lord will move and bring about vengeance for his sake. So the, if you oppress the poor and you don't want to help, the poor will call out to the Lord against you. And so in that sense, when I do fundraising, I'm actually quite happy and very thick skin. I will go and ask people for money because I'm trying to solve you, save you from the sin, okay? Because, <laughs> and don't laugh, huh? after this I'm going to talk to all of you. Then you all, like Hokkien says, once you see me coming, I'll run away. But that's the biblical teaching that God through us, he wants us to be channel of his blessing. And this is just one of the many, many verses in the Bible that tells us this. So giving is a privilege brings us great joy. Giving is relative. Giving is a command. And as Hadi said earlier, giving demonstrates faith in God. And we see this in our focus verse today. Paul, when he looked at how the Macedonians reacted, Paul says this, And this is not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. The giving of the Macedonian church came about because they were first of all committed to God. And that's the first source of all things, that they are right with God. And because of that, everything else falls into place. Therefore, if you say that you are Christian and you never give, you are not generous, you don't care about the poor, you, nothing seems to bother you, it doesn't bring you holy or godly grief, then this verse doesn't quite apply to you. For the churches in Macedonia, their relationship with God was made right first. And then subsequently, they demonstrated their faith in that way. And so as a result of that, the Apostle Paul sent Titus further to the church of Corinth. Accordingly, we urge Titus that he has started so he should complete among you this act of grace, this act of collection for the poor in Jerusalem. But you, you people, you people who are in the church of Corinth, you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all eagerness, and in our love for you. See that you excel in this act of grace also. See that you understand that giving is an act of grace. It's a privilege. Do better than before and give to the poor in Jerusalem. And I'm going to send Titus to you and Titus will collect the offering. That's what the Apostle Paul says. So the question given to us this morning include this question. Do you excel in everything except giving? You know, when I read verse 7, I'm reminded of our church, Reformed Evangelical Church. We really are very good at many things, you know. We, are, we excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in eagerness, really. And we do excel, I suppose, to some extent, in love. I am not very sure whether we excel very much in giving, especially to the poor and to people who need our help. I mean, we are very good at studies, conferences, seminars, and all that. That's our thing, right? We are very good at doctrinal accuracy. So much so that anyone who attends the Reformed Evangelical Church will find it very difficult to attend other churches. Because you sit down, you listen to the sermon, immediately you can poke holes in it. You know? 
well, this is wrong, that one wrong, this wrong, something is wrong with me. You know, so I'm not happy. I must go back to listen to Patong or whatever because we are very good at that. Do we excel in the other area? Are we missing something in this movement? In our Reform Evangelical movement, we talk about the gospel mandate. This is the thing that our senior pastor is very strong on. Then we, were, we are called Reform Evangelical, the evangelism. We go out there and we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Reform part is our theology, Bible-based, the five sola, and then evangelical. So that's the gospel mandate. And we, we, we mentioned that, and we, I think that in, perhaps in world history, our, certainly our mother church, probably hold the record as reaching the most people in the shortest period of time. You know, like 1.6 million people a year, all our evangelists go out to various parts of Indonesia, especially to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that all there is? We also place emphasis on a cultural mandate. This is something that our senior pastor is very strong at as well. You know, now I'm preparing his biography. And one of the things that I just added is something that's quite incredible. In seven days, he toured seven cities with 165 musicians and four tons of equipment, chartering a flight, flying all over the place. For what purpose? To play classical music. Not rock and roll, classical music. And he made the performance free. Admission was free, you know. 20, more than 20,000 people, Bandung, Malang, uh, Samarang, all these various Indonesian cities that had never ever had classical music performance before. Our orchestra and our choir went there to perform all the Mozart and classical music. Why? Because Dr. Tong believes strongly that Christians need to promote cultural mandate together with the gospel mandate. But are we missing something? The president of World Vision USA, Richard Stern, wrote a book called The Hole in Our Gospel. And I encourage you to look out for this book and maybe buy it and read it. Richard Stern, being the guy who is in charge of a Christian charity, World Vision, analyze the situation of Christianity today and ask, is there a hole in our gospel? In, when we talk about gospel mandate and we talk about cultural mandate, are we missing something? Is, it, is that all there is to it? And so he wrote this book to say that actually, as we preach our gospel, there's a hole because we are really lacking at the care we ought to give to the downtrodden people of the world who are made in the image and likeness of God Almighty. And so I want to propose that we are missing one mandate, and that is the social mandate. Do we understand that Scripture wants us to go out there, not only to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only to celebrate Christ and make Him preeminent in all things, in all culture, but at the same time to uphold justice and to serve the poor in the social mandate. I don't know whether senior pastor will watch the video and then come and tell me, I never say there's a third mandate. <laughs> But I think that scripture calls us to do this. And when you look at this, you say, why is it so difficult to be a Christian? Huh? You've got gospel mandate, you've got cultural mandate, you must play classical music, blah, blah, blah. And now you tell me there's a social mandate. I can only tell you that this is the word of God. Now in today's sermon, if you cannot remember anything, there are many things that we talk about. Remember this finally, that it is our Lord Jesus Christ himself who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And remember that Jesus Christ cannot possibly be wrong. But this is the one verse that many of us don't quite believe in, do we? Because if we do, we will give a lot more than we receive, isn't it? But we don't. That is why Jesus Christ has always looked at us and said, you who are of small faith, because we don't have the faith to believe in the plain words of Scripture. May the grace of our Lord be with us this morning and may we always, always remember, as Jesus Christ has said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And may we be a channel of blessing to those who are around us because they too are made in the image and likeness of God. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the word that has been written and the word that has been preached. We want to ask, O God, that you help us understand that there is a purpose for our life. That as we have studied the Bible for the past few weeks and have learned that you have made us ambassadors of Christ, that you are making your appeal through us, 
that you are making us channel of your blessing for the people around us. So help us to understand scripture deeply, that we understand that we are but stewards of all that you have given to us. As Job said, we enter the world naked and we will leave the world naked as well. Help us then to be good stewards of all that you have given to us. Not only fulfilling the gospel mandate that you have given to us and the cultural mandate, certainly help us to look into the social mandate that we need to have. And in so doing, as the scripture tells us, we ought to live a life that has an overflowing abundance of joy. Many of us are far away from that because we are weak. But, O oh Lord, we know you are strong. And exactly as Jesus Christ has said, with men it is impossible. With you, everything is possible. So give us the grace, as the Apostle Paul wrote, the privilege of knowing this abundance of joy so that we will not live this life in vain. And when we shall see you again, you will say that we have lived well. And we will come in and have fellowship with you because we have been good and faithful servants. Bless us, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.